the broad question that I put up on the slide is, do you optimize for multi-core or single core? Many developers do their primary work on desktop. Another segment of developers do their primary work on large shared systems. But we're a library, we have to do both. The particular case here, well, just to give some examples, uh, modern chips, and if you took your architecture classes 20 years ago, this was not so much true, but modern chips, uh, take an example uh, of the Intel Ice Lake Xenon Platinum 8380 has 40 cores, 80 threads, 60 megabytes of L3 cache, what a massive amount compared to my early work, uh, shared by all threads. Now that's only three quarters of a megabyte per thread, which seems a more reasonable amount, but still that's a pretty big spread between the total versus what one thread of is earns. The AMD Epic, a slightly newer chip, has 64 cores, 128 threads, 256 megabytes of L3 cache per chip, uh, split up into 16 segments, each of 16 megabytes, and that comes to two megabytes per thread. Uh, it's pretty common for server class chips these days that have many processors to share the L3 cache against some or all processors. Those two examples are not unique by any means. The particular issue that got this to my attention was that the x86 architecture supports the concept of non-temporal stores, or at least the more recent architectures do. It's a hint to the hardware. When you use the non-temporal store instead of the an ordinary store, don't store the data. Well, it's known that the data is not expected to be read, it, read again soon. So the implementation can choose to either put it in cache or not put it in cache. It's also called streaming stores because you only can bypass the cache when you have enough stores to uh, essentially replace all the current uh, all elements in the cache line. Uh, implementation can be tricky, but hardware guys are pretty smart these days and they've done it. The benefits are you don't push other data out of the cache when you do one of these streaming stores. Uh, and you may reduce memory traffic because the cache line that you're filling up doesn't need to be fetched. You just have a, a side buffer that sends the, the new elements of the cache line out to memory well, without ever pulling in the previous elements. Uh, the drawback is you may reduce opportunities for cache reuse when you've got very large caches available. Basically, when you're doing a streaming store and you don't, um, and you, you have more cache than you need for ordinary purposes. So what, what brought all the attention? Performance issues. Uh, obviously this is a performance application. It doesn't change the correctness of the application. Uh, there was an optimization patch to glibc mem copy uh, several years ago that was tuned to provide maximum improvement for single thread performance on an eight core system by increasing the threshold for when you do non-temporal non stores. Basically, it's saying don't do non-temporal stores so you get more hits uh, when you can. Uh, sometime later, what the upstream code got put into a downstream distribution, and it was observed that the new threshold prevented non-temporal stores on the highly parallel stream benchmark that caused a 20% performance regression when run on a 128 core system. And that's, that was because all 128 cores were active, um, and they were all trying to use that same cache, and they were getting each other's way. In other studies, I did some uh, surveys of the web and found uh, some notes that suggested large copies that clear shared cache can cost 20% performance when you're uh, interacting with a pointer chasing application, something using any sort of linked list management will chase pointers. So. The critical thing to note about this is you lose the performance most often when the system's on its highest load, when you least want to lose performance. 
uh, is that contributes to falling off a cliff and massive increases in latency in client server applications. So what do we do about it? The, here's the, what the situation was. The old threshold was hard coded six times one core share of the L3 cache. And it was based on early eight cores per chip kind of assumptions of, the, uh, of about 10 or 15 years ago. The changed code that brought the attention is now you're allowed three fourths of the total L3 cache for a single thread. And that was based on single thread benchmarks that were used to tune. A per perfectly reasonable approach if you are got the desktop mindset. Uh, so the new threshold is the new computation is saying, MemCopy can use three fourths of one core share of the L3 cache. You want the other fourth to remain available for your, uh, your active working set for the application. So when you return from the mem copy, you've still got whatever the current data that it's working on in the cache. Um, the current glibc philosophy is that activity on one thread should not cause significant negative effects on other threads. You can think of it as, uh, for example, in any of the cloud situations, you've got virtual memory, uh, virtual, I mean, not virtual memory, virtual machines, virtual environments that uh, you might have eight cores assigned to you on a chip that has 128 cores, 16 other applications are using this single chip. You don't want, or 15 other ones, you don't want those 15 other people to gobble up your share of the cache. And as this was to be a lightning talk, I have completed the, the material here. Let me see the, uh, any comments in the chat room that uh, need to be responded to? Any uh, questions at this point? So is this for x86 or some other architecture? Uh, it's for any architecture that is x86 compatible. That would be AMD and x86 would be the best known. Um, okay. it, the non-temporal stores are an x86 specific uh, issues. So the code change was only in the x86 uh, sysdepends branch. But okay. it's worth because noting because... that the model for the L3 cache that, that Patrick's described is the same model they have on uh, the IBM Z series now. So the concept of where, where he's trying to go with this applies much more broadly. No, I think uh, I, I was making a more specific point that uh, okay. I think the mem move uh, for x8664 uh, uses a tunable for non-temporal threshold. Uh, oh, okay. It's dynamic and you can, you can actually uh, tune it according to the workload that that you're uh, you're using. So that that might be one way out of it. Although uh, defaults may be uh, a much much deeper discussion. Yes, and if somebody is doing their own streaming loads and stores that don't call the library routine, a single thread could blow everybody's L3 cache the entire chip's L3 cache. Yep. <laughs> so we're not, we have not solved that total <laughs> issue right here. We, we just it, don't want glibc to be the cause of this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, and I note in the comment about uh, string functions can also have this kind of issue. Yeah, which is why perhaps uh, making the, the threshold dynamically dynamic and having workloads decided might might actually be the the way out of it because I don't see how we can comprehensively solve this inside GLC. Yes, but we may want to look at the other string functions for x86 uh, specific and see if they could benefit from non-temporal stores as well or it, any of the the modification functions memset may have a similar issue. 
I haven't looked at any of that code. I was the real point of this talk was to bring the the concept of oversharing or overuse of a chip's cache by a single thread uh, as an awareness issue. Yeah, I think uh, Vilko had done some uh, study probably a year or two back on string functions, not not the mem functions, uh, where he found that a majority of the workload uh, for the string functions are usually short to medium strings. So you, you're, you're not right. really frequently uh, doing very long string copies. Uh, mem copies are a different uh, issue. Mem copies, mem sets, mem moves. Uh, you That's frequently a good have large, large blocks. So having uh, a non-temporal threshold over there is is a lot more valuable than uh, than a, uh, in in the string functions. But yes, it, it's probably something that needs to be codified somewhere, either in the wiki or in in some sort of a paper or something like that. Right. And as Nick notes, when you're single threaded and it's the only live thread, then it's not overused to hold the whole cache. But in a cloud virtual environment, uh, there's no way to know whether you are the only user of the entire chip. Uh, but if you're in a dedicated own the system, uh, high performance computing kind of environment, then there are times you know that you're doing the communication uh, when you're copying blocks of data for the all the other threads to get to work on, you want to do it as fast as you can. Lots and of different situations, and so tunables could be a good long-term uh, answer for those people that have unusual uh, single thread needs. Yeah, and, I, and on, on a related point, uh, the source of this problem that you're talking about is the fact that we optimized for single thread, and one of the things to blame for that is probably uh, the benchmarks. Uh, the GLFC bench tests are overwhelmingly single threaded, so we probably need more coverage there as well. I think we're uh, near the end of our time. Uh, I have us at 1029, my local time. Uh, so might okay, as well so thanks very let much. the next uh, talk get started. Yes. Thanks for very uh, interesting, insightful. Uh, presentation, lots of good conversation, good uh, good ideas about how to, to move this forward. So we definitely need to think more about uh, caching and, and memory usage and uh, is it virtual machines and uh, dedicated machines. There's a lot of uh, challenges of how to find the right balance for all this. So thanks very much for, for raising this topic and uh, for pursuing this, this issue.